All right, how's it going, y'all? So today we're gonna to be going over things that pretty much every single user should have set up in Synology DSM. And I will say there's a few caveats to this, and if there ever is, I will let you know. And we're really going to be focusing on just the bare necessities that you should probably be able to set and forget and not really worry about. Also, if you'd like to hire me, there's a link for that down in the description below. I do consulting. All right, so these are all going to be really focused on making sure that your data is protected, that you're not filling up your NAS unnecessarily, and just that you know stuff that is going on. And there have been some major updates in the last year that have a lot of great new features that we're gonna be using here. So if you're not on DSM 7.2, you really probably want to update now. So I'm gonna be talking about a few different really nice DSM 7.2 features here. Go ahead and update because it's well worth it and it is rock solid steady. There are a few units that it will not work on and that is unfortunate. All right, so we're gonna kind of section this off into different parts, security, data protection, data well-being, and just overall ease of use slash NAS cleanup is the easiest way I can describe it. And so we're going to start with security pieces here. There's a ton more that it can be done here, but these are just really good, quick and easy things you can just check, 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 check off and make sure you have. So the very first one we're gonna go in is we're going to go into file services and make sure that you've got SMB v1 not enabled. So your minimum SMB protocol should be SMB v2 with the exception of people who have like a Sonos or a really old like Windows 7 box or XP. If you have to enable SMB v1, some older devices only support SMB v1, really just go through and make sure you have a good secure local network because it is okay to run this if it's on a firewalled off system, but the vast majority of users just set it to SMB v2 and if something breaks, then you kind of can figure it out from there. And in the exact same vein while you're doing that, make sure you say disable NTLMV1 auth. So both of those are the exact same boat. Normally, you actually have to enable both at the same time to do it. So ideally, minimum SMB protocol SMB v2 and disabling NTLMV1 authentication. Then from there, it's pretty well secured out. Next up, We've got a whole list of things that unless you really know what you're doing, you should have disabled. And that is going to be AFP. AFP has been deprecated by macOS. Definitely, definitely disable that unless you really have to. And if you currently have it enabled, see if you can get off of it as soon as possible because it is no longer supported by macOS and inevitably there are going to be security vulnerabilities associated with it. NFS, unless you really know what you're doing with NFS, you should probably have it disabled because NFS doesn't really have authentication, you use IP-based authentication. So realistically, unless you know what you're doing and you've got a closed off VLAN that's just for storage or for virtual machines, don't touch NFS until you know what you're doing. FTP, ideally you don't have just standard FTP on, instead you use something like FTPS or SFTP, but disable that one if you can. All right, so those were all pieces that were probably good to disable unless you know what you're doing. Another one is going to be SSH. I always SSH into my NAS, but unless you know what you're doing, probably a good idea to leave off until you're comfortable SSHing in, just because it's one of those things you just don't want to leave open unnecessarily. But first, I'd like to take a quick break to thank the sponsor of today's video, Delete Me. Did you know that your personal data is being sold online by data brokers? You have the right to privacy, and to protect your personal data online. Data brokers are corporations that collect huge amounts of personal information, like addresses, phone numbers, birthdays, and even social security numbers, from sites like government public records and even social media. They then aggregate this data to create listings and profiles and then sell that data to either other data brokers who will just sell it to other people, or p companies who want access to private information for things like targeted ads. Having this information out there increases the risks of being targeted for identity theft or of being the target of a phishing scam. Delete Me can help protect you from the risks of identity theft by removing your personal data from hundreds of data broker websites. They then show you a privacy report showing you all the personal data they were able to find and remove. And they then continue to monitor websites and do further takedowns as required. Get 20% off Delete Me US customer plans by going to joindeleteme.com slash rex and use promo code rex at checkout. That is joindeleteme.com slash rex promo code rex. 
Thanks again to Delete Me for sponsoring this section of the video. Now back to the video. All right, so that was my list of features that you probably want to have disabled. Next up, we're going to have just some overall security settings here. So we're just gonna pop into security. And in general, you're going to want to go into account and at minimum, enable adaptive MFA because this is super easy. It is a DSM 7.2 feature that allows you to just have, if an admin is signing out from outside the local network, they have to have a email code sent from a Synology.com email address that has the emergency code to get in. It's the same thing your bank uses, really easy, and it's a great place to get two-factor authentication. You get like 90% the benefit of two-factor authentication for 10% the pain. So definitely something to enable. Firewall, most people actually do not need a firewall, so we're not going to have that enabled. And then this is something everybody should have on, and that is auto block. This is what I like to have. Ten login attempts within five minutes and unblock after one or two days. These are all easy things to set up that give you a significant amount of security. Auto block is a must have for pretty much every single environment, unless you have really specific use case, because you don't want people to be able to just brute force their way in eventually. So rounding out the security section, we have making sure that this account label as admin is disabled. It's okay to have multiple accounts under administrators, but the account that is called admin is a special account that you really don't want to use. You should just have it deactivated and then just put your user and whoever manages the NAS in the group under administrators. That's the easiest way to do it. You just add people to that and that gives them the permissions. If you also want to be extra cautious, I will often just come in here and say, change password, generate a random password and hit save. Even though the NAS is deactivated, I still always just change the password out of habit, just in case it's ever one of those things that bites you, right? All right, so that rounds out the basic security stuff. We've got a couple more things here that are just kind of in the gray area, and that is going to be under our scheduled updates. So we're gonna go into our update and restore settings, and under update settings, I would recommend every single person at minimum say automatically install important updates because this allows Synology to auto update your NAS if there's a massive CVE that is resolved. So say there's a massive vulnerability found right here. This will allow Synology to automatically update your NAS with that bug fix. Then for just minor feature upgrades and everything like that, they don't touch it. I think this is a great minimum place to be for anything that's exposed to the internet at all. If you are using the NAS as like a VM server, obviously you probably don't want it to auto update, especially if it's on a closed off network. So that is up to you, but for pretty much everybody else, automatically install updates just in case. Next up, we've got a feature that I've belabored to death and that is scheduled snapshots. And it is a great transition between security and data protection. So you wanna make sure you go in the package center and download an app called Snapshot Replication. Then come in here and set up snapshot schedule on all your shared folders, except for active back of your business, time machine, or surveillance cameras. Those are the three that you kinda of wanna set up a different snapshot schedule on, but we're not gonna talk about those here too much. Basically, when in doubt, have one snapshot a week for those two and have them deleted after three weeks is normally what I'll do. And I just won't have snapshots for security cameras. But for everybody else, just shift select everything, go into settings and just create a snapshot schedule that starts at 8 a.m. every two hours to 8 p.m. Then set this on up to say, all right, we wanna keep snapshots for 14 days and then dailies for 30 days. This is like just my, my default. It's a great place to be. And set this up and watch my video on snapshots because snapshots will protect you from so much stuff. They can help protect you from things like ransomware because if a computer on the network gets a virus and encrypts all the files on the NAS, it probably encrypted them just via SMB and does not have admin access so you can just undo it. There's so many things here to absolutely check out and make sure you've got on. Definitely, definitely, if you do one thing in this video, it's set up snapshots right now. I talk about it in other videos, but when you're thinking about how much space these snapshots are using, it's nothing more than the space a recycling bin that emptied after 30 days would use. 
So if you don't delete any files, it takes up no space. But if you delete a one terabyte file, you're not gonna get that space back for 30 days, but you can recover your data for 30 days. So that is a great place to be. And then just make them visible is generally what I'll do. Super useful, check it out in other videos. I go over it a lot, but you really wanna make sure you've got a snapshot schedule running. Continuing on with our scheduled data protection, we want to go in and we wanna make sure we've got a scrub set up on our volumes. So it's not set up by default, but when you come in here, you wanna make sure your volume, you hit schedule data scrubbing, select all volumes, repeat every three months. And then I also always set run data scrubbing only during specific periods and set a time grid. So set this time grid to outside of working hours or outside the time you're using the NAS. So that way the scrub is only running when you're not using it. Basically what a scrub is, is every three months, the NAS is gonna read every single file on itself and it's going to check them for errors. BTRFS and also with RAID a little bit, you get some too, even with ext 4 they can actually recover from small errors per section of file, but they can't recover from multiple. So essentially, if a hard drive flips a one to a zero or a zero to one, the file system can recover it as long as it doesn't happen too many times on the same file before a data scrub is run or the file is read. So by setting up a data scrub to run every three months, you make sure that your files are read every three months and checked for errors. And this gives you the ability to almost guarantee that in 15 years, that file is gonna be readable because it's been read every three months ever since. And if it has gotten any errors, which hard drives have bit rot, they flip ones to zeros because of the solar flares. I'm not even joking. It will be able to help make sure that there's not so many errors per section of file that it's irrecoverable. So set that up and once again, a thing you can completely forget. In the upper right hand corner, you will sometimes see a scrubbing status. Don't worry about it. Just let it do its thing and that's it. Another one that's a bit for performance over here is under settings, disable record file access time. It's not really used for much of anything. And I also like to enable usage detail analysis just to kind of see what space is being taken up on the NAS. But right now, because I shut this NAS down without actually powering off properly, and I did a whole bunch of things wrong with this NAS, it is having to re-optimize the drives, so I can't do that currently. Another one in the same vein of protecting data is to make sure you have a smart quick test running every 30 days normally. So I don't really schedule extended tests that often anymore because I really have not found them to be that useful. So just go in and create a quick test on all drives. I'll be honest with you, I've not seen these actually give great results, but it's still probably just a good thing to schedule. In general, if a hard drive has an issue, it's gonna tell you before a smart test actually will find it, at least from my experience. Then if you do find an issue, that's when you can run an extended smart test, or at least that's how I do it normally. Another piece to data protection is Whenever you're creating a new shared folder, by default, you should always just hit enable data checksum for advanced data integrity. Pretty much always. It is really good to have, and from my testing, does not really decrease your performance, at least in any way that I've been able to really measure. And so it's a great thing to just, by default, check on every single folder, unless you're needing to have like a database on here that needs super quick access. So just always enable that data checksum for advanced data integrity. Pretty much every single time you set up a folder, I will say it's probably not worth wiping and redoing a folder just because it's not on, but just get in the habit. Every single time you set it up, go ahead and execute that. Now, we also wanna make sure that if the NAS has a problem, we get notified about it. And so that's where you wanna come in here under notifications. This is another DSM 7.2 feature. Make sure you've got a email to your Synology account. And this is absolutely worth linking a Synology account for because previously you could use a mail server like Gmail, but the problem is Gmail will update the authentication requirements and boom, now the NAS has to re-authenticate. Oh, but now the NAS can't tell you it can't send emails because it can't send any emails. So it's a horrible cycle. This is somewhat foolproof it will send you an email notification through Synology's mail servers to one account if there's a problem with the NAS. 
And so it's a great backup thing to have. Even if you have your own mail server on there, I still recommend having it just because it can really help protect you. And if the NAS tells you something's wrong, you can fix it before it's a problem. All right, next one is backup. I'm not gonna go over it here, but schedule a backup. You need to have a backup. Nothing we've gone over, snapshots are not a backup. Nothing we've gone over in this video is an actual backup. Not RAID, not checksums, not snapshots, not data scrubbing. None of that is actually a backup. The only backup is a backup. That can be USB copy, snapshot replication, so knowledge drive share sync, or probably for most people, hyper backup. I talk about it in other videos, buy a eight terabyte external hard drive, leave it plugged in the NAS 24 seven, and pick your most important files to back up every single night. It's an easy place to get started for most people. All right, so now we got two last things for kind of just NAS usability. I don't know how to categorize these. And one is a really common error I see, and it's kind of funny, is the recycling bin. Make sure you go into task scheduler and you have a task labeled empty bins. I always set this up the very first thing I do and say delete all recycling bins and you can choose how long you want it. Realistically, I normally just say two days because the snapshots that we set up are a much better version of this than this. But you would not believe how many times I've hopped on a call because somebody needs to expand their NAS and they want to know the best way to. And it turns out that they just had a ton of data in their recycling bin. I'm talking 40 terabytes in the past because it's something that if you've not set it up, you kind of forget about and you might not even see. So definitely make sure you've got a empty bin task and it will absolutely be worth your while. We're also going to go in and I really like having restart automatically when power supply is fixed. So if the power to the NAS goes off, when it comes back online, it'll automatically boot back up. Not a bad idea to also get a UPS, but I like having this because if you're in France and you really need those files, but your power reset, you don't have to call up your neighbor to go knock on your door and turn it on manually. Also, while I'm in here, this is a really useful thing to know where it is. If the NAS starts beeping, you can come in here and it'll tell you why it's beeping and you can mute it. Really useful thing to know. All right, so now one last one that I do find very useful, especially if you're debugging performance data ever, is to come into your resource manager, go into settings and enable the data usage history. This way you can get a chart telling you your performance parameters throughout the past years. So if you're figuring out why is this thing slow at certain times, you can go back and see historic data really easily. I really like having this and it makes it really nice to debug when a user says the NAS is slow. This one's more for businesses, but I still like having it on. All right, well, we just went over a ton of features there. There is so many more things, but these are all just quick settings that you really wanna make sure you've got enabled and you can kind of have a checkbox list off. If you'd like to hire me, there's a link for that down in the description below. I do a ton of consulting down at yarbrotechnologies.com. And if you have any other questions, you can put those down in the comments below as well as any other tutorials you'd like to see me make. All right, have a good one. Bye.